members to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming today. Um, I hope you're looking forward to the session as I am. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping bits to get us started. Um, my name is Christina Trunnell. I am the host for today's session. Uh, our speaker is the wonderful Ms. Amanda Larson, who will be <laughs> sharing some great things for us today as we go through the session. Um, just so you know, um, we will be recording this session and we will be adding that to our YouTube Pub 101 playlist. Uh, we also at the OEN are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for everyone aligned with our community norms. Uh, if you've never had a chance to review the community norms, I highly recommend you do. They are inspiring. Uh, and please join us today as we um, listen to Amanda's talk in creating a safe and constructive space. Uh, I will also be monitoring the chat um, during the presentation. So if you have questions, I will keep note of those during that time. And then it is my delightful pleasure to introduce you to Amanda Larson today. All right, now I'm gonna reshare my screen. We'll see if I can do that with any sense of grace or a plume. Can I get a thumbs up, Christina, if you can see it? Awesome. Hi, everybody. Today, we're gonna to talk about individual and organizational capacity. So what you need to think about before you start thinking about building a publishing program. Um, I am going to start whoops, by um, talking a little bit about my background in this area. So um, I'm Amanda Larson. I'm the Affordable Learning Instructional Consultant at The Ohio State University. Um, but my work in publishing started all the way back in my first master's degree where I was the editorial assistant at the Journal of Narrative Theory. And I got lots of questions from folks about if their article could be put into institutional repositories, if they had a mandate to make it open access. And that was sort of my first introduction to thinking about publishing in open. Then in my second master's degree, where I decided that I was going to be a librarian, um, I got a position as the Open Educational Resources Teaching Assistant. And there I helped folks sort of grassroots style um, think about how they would be publishing open textbooks through press books. So um, it was my job to do the press books training and to lead the community of practitioners. So we had a uh, monthly meeting where we got together and would chat about how they were using the OER that they created. Um, my first real librarian job was as the open education librarian at Penn State University, where I was responsible for co-leading a grant program. Um, and I think as we go through my slides and presentation, you'll see how those two scenarios play out. Um, there, I was responsible for um, collaborating with stakeholders across the university. So we had an affordable learning working group that focused on open education and affordable resources and had stakeholders from all over the university in it. Um, and we had a grant program that went through two and a half rounds while I was there. I was there for the first like selection process for the third round of the Affordable Course Transformation Grant Program. Um, now I'm the Affordable Learning Instruction Consultant at Ohio State and I support the Affordable Learning Exchanges Grant Program as part of my position there. And what that looks like is helping um, ALX connect grant winners to librarians, subject librarians who can help them find course content for their materials. Um, I also do a lot of syllabus review grants where I help curate OER to help bring down the cost of classes. Um, I also support racial justice grants where folks are trying to make their courses more equitable by either decolonizing their syllabus, so looking for um, BIPOC authors to add to their syllabus, um, or including like a racial justice pedagogy to their course materials and thinking through what that is. The other part of my job, I spend thinking about how 
folks can incorporate open pedagogy into their courses. Um, so that's a little bit about me. And um, here's our agenda for today. We're gonna to talk about why a publishing program. We're gonna talk about different ways you could approach developing a program at your institution. Um, we're gonna figure out who's doing the work, what that might look like at your institution. Um, we're gonna talk about building collaborative definitions at your institution around things. Uh, we're gonna talk about communication training and community building and the roles that those might play. And we're also gonna talk about self-care and then I'm going to leave you with some takeaway considerations. And I'm hoping that I do this in plenty of time for y'all to ask questions, but please drop questions in the chat as we go through the presentation, and I'll be happy to answer them. So the first question that I think if you're at the very beginning of thinking about starting a publishing program is asking yourself why. So what's the why for starting your program? And there are a lot of questions you can ask to sort of get at the answer to that question. So is there an underlying institutional need that you're responding to? Um, do you have like a ton of students who are using the food bank and so you see a demonstrated need for some affordability initiatives at your institution? Is there a top-down mandate from your administration? So it's been very popular for both presidents and provosts of institutions to be like, I care about affordability and now we're gonna figure out how to do it and that leads to the formation of a grant program. That's what happened to me at Penn State. Um, is it part of a larger initiative on campus? Are there folks who are already sort of doing affordability work in your publishing program would help with that effort? Does it support your goals for outreach to instructors? Um, or does it support your goals for um, outreach to students? Because there's a lot of student initiatives you could think about too. Um, will it focus on multiple avenues of participation? So if you're thinking about a publishing program, is it gonna be just for people who want to adopt OER? Or in the case of thinking about publishing, are they gonna be doing remixing or are they going to be authoring content? And then is it part of your outreach strategy for affordability? So there's a lot of advocacy that goes into running a grant program and a lot of opportunities to do targeted outreach as part of that. Um, strategy. So the first thing you need to consider is why are you doing this? And it might even be a reason that I haven't listed. Um, what I have seen pretty unilaterally across uh, higher education institutions is that it tends to fall into one or two kinds of approaches. Um, there is sort of the do-it-yourself model where it's one person or a very small team of people who are working to move the dial for, ahead on affordability. And um, they may have different goals, support expectations and communications that they need to do in order to be successful. Or there can be a publishing program style where it is a much larger team and it is includes stakeholders from across the university. So multiple units who focus on teaching, for example, might be a thing and their support like identifying support and partners and the roles in that are gonna look a little different than it would if it was a smaller team. So the first thing is thinking about support. So what services are you willing or have capacity to support? And you need to think through um, a couple different things. What does working with authors to create brand new works look like? And how does that differ from folks who might be able to adapt and remix works to create a new product? Um, those are very different workloads. Um, authors who are authoring new works can sometimes be easier an easier lift because what they're creating is new and they might not necessarily be incorporating other resources into it. Um, Whereas working with authors to adapt can have a little more heavy lifting on your side as the support person because you have to verify that their OER Creative Commons licenses are, you know, playing nicely together and are compatible, um, that they aren't randomly mixing in um, copyrighted works, which I've had happen to me in the past. And um, you might also want to identify at the very beginning of your program, if you want to work with authors to make the materials that they're making culturally relevant or incorporate a racial justice curriculum. So that would mean making sure that when faculty and instructors in your program are making sure that they're including 
um, images that represent diverse people, not just a bunch of white people, um, and not just a bunch of men necessarily, that you have you know, mixed groups of people together that represent a broader spectrum. But it also means thinking about the implicit bias that texts might already have if they are being remixed. Um, it may also be thinking about whose voices you want to bring into that curriculum and how to do that. Um, the other thing to think about at the very beginning before you start thinking about what a publishing program will look like is what tools do you have to offer to do this publishing work? So is there anything available to you through your institution? I always proponent starting with institution-wide um, products. So for example, at both Ohio State and Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin and Ohio State, I have had access to Pressbooks as a publishing tool. Um, but there are other places that people can publish. So there's Manifold, which is another authoring tool. Um, Scribe is a potential um, option through the publishing cooperative. Um, there are folks who just use their learning management system. So it's figuring out what tools you have available to you and what you can offer to faculty in order to do that publishing. And then thinking after, okay, if we have a tool to make the thing, you have to figure out where you're going to put the thing that they make. So do you have an institutional repository? Um, would you be wanting to host it in an OER Commons hub? Is there gonna be a website? Will it be hosted just in the LMS learning management system? Um, so you need to figure out how you're gonna make the content and then where's the content going to live? So what can this look like? In the DIY model, um, it depends. There are a couple different scenarios here. So it could be like um, when I was at Wisconsin, it was all grassroots. Um, there was just enough money for an OER teaching assistant, but there weren't grants or anything. These people were, these instructors were just doing this because they wanted to. Um, either they believed in open education as a thing, or they had been teaching with their own course materials and just wanted to make it look more polished for a long time. Um, or it could look like it's a submit, like it is supported through administration and there is some money possibly coming from, uh, money or support coming through administration. That's the next question. Is there cash for OER? So if it's a grant program, are you gonna be offering stipends? If you're not offering stipends, what support are you offering instructors who go through your publishing program? Is it just you doing all of the support or do you have a small team? Um, because you can think about like, what collaborators do you have? Um, and that can still be cross unit, but I usually I've seen that it's like usually within the same unit. Um, do you have money to get a student work or can you secure a teaching assistantship for a graduate student? Um, these are all ways that you bolster support if you have to sort of do the do it yourself model. Then there's the broader publishing program model where it's a bigger team of people um, and the support can look different. So there could be a lot of administrative support, which administrators are offering the support. Is it from your provost? Is it the dean of your library? Is it the head of the teaching and learning center? Um, there's something else to consider though with that institutional support is does it come from the top down? So is it the president, the president or the provost and then it trickles down into the unit level? Or does that support sort of bubble up from specific units across your institution? That might change your outreach strategy. Um, financial, again, where is the money coming from if there is money to be had? And um, I think that we'll start to see that our institutions start recovering from the COVID denotations here. Um, but it could also have ch really changed the way that folks are thinking about affordability at your institution. And then who's on the team? And that question is a lot broader than when you're doing it, the do-it-yourself model, because there are going to be stakeholders that have to be involved because you're all working together on this. And if that's the case, who's going to do that day-to-day -day work of supporting the publishing program? When somebody reaches out with a question, who does that question go to? And um, it could be you as the person, or it could be somebody else on your team who's going to be doing that particular part of the work. So 
the next thing I would say as you're thinking about building a publishing program is to think about your partners. And the question I always ask myself is who has a seat at the table? So if you are in sort of a do-it-yourself situation, I really recommend thinking about that because you could still build a nice small team for yourself. Um, but when you're in sort of that bigger programmatic publishing program, um, it's definitely going to be a group of stakeholders who are doing that work. So I like to think about who should be there. Um, you'll notice at the top of my list is students. Um, I feel very strongly that students need to have a place at the table. At Penn State, we had representatives from student government on our affordable working group. And um, we would ask them for advice or ask them to reach out to other students for advice around the publishing products that we were making. Um, inside the library, or inside the Center for Teaching and Learning, depending on where the program is starting from. And this could have a different name at your institution. Um, faculty, we have faculty representat representatives, um, the bookstore, and bookstore relationships may vary the same as with if you have a university press or an academic press at your institution, um, whether they care about OER or not is up in the air. Um, different academic units. So um, at Ohio State, we do a lot of work with the College of Arts and Sciences and also institutional specific units. So um, that could be like um, instructional design units. Um, so at Ohio State, we have the Office of Technology and Distance Education. Um, and at Penn State, it was like teaching and learning with technology. And they had like really, they were sort of a centralized hub versus a center for teaching and learning. So there could be really specific units at your institution who you could partner with. And again, this is not a comprehensive list. This is just a list to get you start thinking about potential partners. So you have identified all of your support people and partners and stakeholders. And I think it's important to start thinking through what the expectations are. So you've started thinking about how you're gonna support your publishing effort and you need to think about two things really explicitly. What are your expectations for faculty authors and what support can they expect from you? And I think it's really important to figure these two things out before you get started. Um, Note the bullet here that says it's great to get it in writing before you launch, but it can definitely be iterative and grow with your initiative. But I think you should definitely have thought about it to begin with. Um, so if you know, hey, I am just a one person pro publishing program here, there's no way I can do hands on support for every instructor who wants to create um, an OER. I can't, like, I'm not going to be able to offer them copy editing. Um, I'm not going to be able to do like work with them explicitly inside whatever tool we've decided on. If you can figure that out before you get started and then communicate those clearly ahead of time, I think it really sets good expectations for the instructors that you're working with. Um, in addition to that, what are your expectations for authors? Um, do they have to meet a certain criteria? in order to be eligible for your grant. So at some institutions, um, adjunct faculty might not be able to author or accept grant money. That's something to figure out. Um, do you expect that they'll handle all of the copy editing? Um, do you expect that they will do all of the vetting of the items that they find for their remix? And, um, in the past, I have always like set up my instructors, like here's a spreadsheet, um, when you go through and you're looking for OER that you're going to curate for your thing, I want you to write down the title, the author, uh, the source, and where you found it, and then also the license, because then I can take a look at a spreadsheet and be like, okay, these things aren't compatible because of their license, we need to replace those, rather than getting to the end of the project and being like, oh my gosh, you have copyrighted images in here, and 
this license doesn't match with that license. Um, if you can set those clear expectations for what you have for them and the workload that they're going to do to create this as part of the program, that is a great place to start out. So it's also really important to define roles in your team. Um, who's gonna do what? And where does it make sense to collaborate? Um, so maybe you have access to instructional designers who can help faculty create learning objectives and goals for their materials or um, can do some of that curation work. Maybe you have librarians, like subject librarians who can help faculty curate OER in their discipline. Uh, maybe you have students who want to advocate with administration to get money for your initiative. Um, and maybe the bookstore can help identify courses or provide print copies of OER at no cost, or I'm sorry, at cost. Um, so thinking about um, printing an OER that an instructor created or carrying open stacks books there um, would be ways to work with your bookstore. But it's really ideal to figure out who's doing what and where you're going to collaborate at, what are those what are those points of interaction? Clear communication. This can't be stated enough. Um, most of your work facilitating as a project manager is going to be about clearly communicating with all of the stakeholders in your publishing initiative. Um, my recommendations are to adopt an ethos of transparency. If you're just upfront about everything, you don't have to worry about people saying, oh, I misinterpreted what you said. Um, create shared language early. How are you defining OER and affordability? Um, what, how are you defining publishing? What counts? Um, and you'll learn more about uh, creating a memorandum of understanding or an MOU for authors later on in the publishing cohort here in Pub 101. But it's a good idea to be thinking about a memorandum of understanding for authors that clearly details what they are agreeing to do and articulates what you will do to support them. So that ties back to those expectation settings that you were thinking about earlier. Um, and then I can't overstate this enough, but communicating regularly with stakeholders and communicating regularly with your authors are really important. Um, I've had several situations where I thought I was doing the right thing and I was waiting for like another piece of information before I communicated out some information and somebody would get upset that I hadn't told them X, Y, or Z already. So I recommend communicate regularly, communicate often, and um, just keep everybody in the loop as much as possible. And this is really important if you're working with a large team of people um, doing disparate tasks where maybe you don't necessarily talk to each other all that regularly within the day-to-day -day of your work. For the do-it-yourself model, I think it's really important to rely on um, the teach the teacher model. Um, so it's important to teach your authors to be self-sufficient and self-starters. So in that model, it's really normal to provide training for tools, licensing, open pedagogy if they're interested in it, and then offer support for follow-up questions. So that could look like holding a workshop where, say, you introduce folks to authoring on Pressbooks. So you take them through, through Pressbooks, you show them a tour of the tool, you make them a sandbox account so that they can get in and play around with it. And then they're like the authoring part is up to them. It could also look like a workshop where you teach people about Creative Commons licensing. Um, or after they're been involved, maybe you have some one-on-one um, -on -one consultations where you talk about how they can, now you have this OER, how would you use open pedagogy with it? Um, or have your students contribute to it in the future as part of an open pedagogy plan. Um, but apart from that, um, getting them together to also teach their peers, which we'll talk about again in a minute, and um, get them to be willing to sort of like be peer helpers for each other is really also very useful. But you want to set that clear expectation up front. 
this is what I can train you in. And this is how I can support you with follow-up questions or troubleshooting. Say they have like an issue with their Pressbook account or something, like you could troubleshoot that, but you can't help them with like the actual authoring part. They have to go do that on their own. Um, and let's move on to building a community. So it's dangerous to go alone. Take this small adorable kitten with you instead. Um, I find that instructors who start doing this work can often feel like they're alone, that they're the only people who are doing this. Um, so I recommend start really small. If you only have a couple of publishing projects, just get those instructors together to chat about how they're working. Um, this often um, will bring up areas where you didn't know that they had questions. Um, and it's really important to start your program small too. So say you can only support two publishing projects to start with. Like that's still a whole lot for doing something brand new. And you can always grow that over time. And then back to about starting a community of practice. So I have done this in a couple of different ways. Um, and there's really great um, information uh, from I think Minnesota State around faculty learning communities. communities. And um, I did a community of practice at uh, the University of Wisconsin. And um, it was really great. It started with just the handful of people that we were working with. And so what it did was allow us to introduce them to each other. Um, we had them share their projects. So we did like a big show and tell. And um, then we invited them after each session to discuss what was working and then what they were struggling with. Um, and this really enables them to not feel so alone in creating OER because maybe they're the only person in their department who's doing this, but there's somebody else in another department who's doing it and they can feel not alone. And that community of practice built up to us leading the initiative. So we did like a Pressbooks 101 training and we did a, and then we did like an advanced press books training to teach them some more cool things that they could do in it. And then we did like that showcase where we had them talk about their projects. And then after that, I reached out to them and been like, hey, would you like to lead 15 minutes of the, our community of practice session to talk about how you're using H5P, which is an interactive HTML5 plugin that you can use in press books uh, to create interactive formative assessments. And that person would come in and do that. And then um, we had another session where a person came in and talked about using Hypothesis, which is a social annotation tool, which also can be incorporated into Pressbooks. I sound like a Pressbooks commercial, I swear I'm not. Um, and they came in and chatted about that. And then we had um, an anatomy instructor who was working on building GIFs that showed like how arms like the muscle rotation in the arm worked um, for their nursing book and we had them talk about that process um, and it made them think a they learned from each other and um, they also started thinking about how they could do those things in their classrooms as well um, so i highly recommend if you have the opportunity in your publishing program to think about building a community of So self-care, um, I think it's really important to acknowledge that this work can be extremely isolating, particularly if you're doing it in the do-it-yourself model where it's just you doing this work. Um, and it involves not only a lot of emotional labor, but a lot of invisible labor because you're doing behind the scenes support work. Um, you often have to have tough conversations with faculty about the limitations of your program um, or new technologies. And sometimes faculty are really scared of new technologies. You might also be scared of running new technologies. It might seem really scary. Um, and so these are just things that you're going to encounter. And um, so the example I like to share here is that when I was at Penn State, my first office was literally in a tower. No one knew where to find me. Uh, no one could get to my office because it re required an elevator trip up in an elevator that had a key. And it was like one of those old rickety elevators from like the early 1920s or something. Um, and 
so I, I felt not only like literally isolated, but then my work was also very isolating. Um, and the emotional labor comes in a couple of different ways. Um, when you become the open, affordable person and you're the face of that at your institution, you're often called on to advocate. And that means that sometimes you have to like bury your own emotions so that you can get the point across to maybe a hostile audience. Um, and the invisible labor comes in doing, thinking about like the production work that you do, all of the outreach connections that you do, um, but it doesn't have to be dire. So this work can be very hard, but it doesn't have to be helpful, helpless. So what I recommend is build a network so you don't feel so alone. You have all of these lovely people here today who could be your network. Um, and even broader than that, like there's the open education network itself as a network. Um, there's all of these lovely people who are doing this work out in the wild, who are probably more than happy to answer your questions. Um, I also think it's really important to set boundaries about the work that you're doing. Um, and that involves also interactions with instructors and faculty. Um, and not only set them, but stick to those boundaries. Um, if you don't answer emails after five, don't answer that email from that instructor who's having a panic. And I know that's very hard, but it's really important to set those boundaries and stick to them. For tough questions, um, I have given a lot of talks about like the benefits of OER and why I think instructors should adapt and adopt and author OER. And there's always one curmudgeonly old professor who's there with like a million tough questions that can make it feel like, oh my gosh, I'm under attack all the time. What I find helps with this is to think about all of the really hard questions that someone is going to ask you and pre-plan some answers to that. So if you have an instructor who you know is going to be like, going to question the quality of OER, um, you can pre-plan an answer to that and you know identify a couple of research articles that might support your position. Um, we had a really great instance where uh, we were giving a presentation at a big um, teaching and learning uh, conference for across the whole institution. And um, there was, an, uh, we had a student government representative on the um, panel and he volunteered to answer the question about quality and just started like citing all of these benefits of OER and how they had been found um, to be of same or equal quality to other traditional textbook materials. And it was really nice to see a student be that well versed in the um, way to, shut down, to like shut down a question like that very respectfully with um, answers. And then the other thing I would recommend is that you remember that you don't have to master everything. It's okay if you are not a master copy editor right now. You don't have to become a master copy editor. You just put that in the list of things that um, you're, you can't support, that the library or instructional design unit can't support. Um, and there are lots of training materials that you can find to help you learn the tools that you do need to support for your institution. And um, there are plenty of people to ask questions to, and I'm one of them. Please ask me questions. I'm happy to answer them. You can reach out to me anytime about anything. You can throw a consultation question, like a consultation on my calendar. I have an open calendar that I let people um, make appointments on, and I'm happy to answer questions about any of this at any time. So wrapping this up and um, then we'll move into questions, but these are things that I think that you should take away with you. And the first one is, are there differences between your capacity as an individual and your organization's capacity? And what does that mean for you? So in your capacity, in your role, what do you have the ability to do? And what does your organization have to do? And then I would also think about 
where do those things intersect? Um, does your capacity point at a particular publishing approach? So maybe you're looking at, you're sitting here in this presentation, you're thinking, okay, so my institution doesn't have money to do this right now, but I'm being asked to spin up a publishing program. So I'm gonna be in this do-it-yourself model. Um, or it could be the opposite where your institution has lots of ability to support it and you're gonna be in a more broader publishing um, program and you need to think through that capacity. And then I like to think about publishing programs as phased approaches. So what are you prepared to support right now? And that could be um, starting simple with like OER adoptions and building into a publishing program or you might be ready to start a publishing program, but you can only take on one or two projects. Um, or you could be like, I already know that my provost wants me to have seven projects. I have to give out seven grants and how will I scale that up in the future? Um, but thinking about it as a phased approach and what you can support right this second um, and what you could support later if that's successful. Um, I also would think through in this question is what are, in addition to what are you prepared to support right now, what do you need in order to be able to support it at that level right now? So do you need to get tool training so that you understand how to use the tools that are available at your institution? Do you need to identify a tool and like make a recommendation that the university purchases it? Um, think through not only what are you prepared to support, but like, what do you have access to support? What training do you need to do that support work? Um, and that can be part of that based approach of where are you gonna start now? Where will you be a year from now? And thinking through what you might wanna do later. What conversations do you need to have in your organization to better answer these questions? So if you don't have the answer to that question right now, that is 100% fine. But if you are thinking about a publishing program, who do you need to talk to in your organization so that you can answer those questions? Um, and then think really broadly about partnerships and what partnerships across your organization could help this work. Um, what organizations could or stakeholders could be um, problematic. So sometimes I hear that like the bookstore, the university press is really hostile to the idea of open publishing. And, um, and I have been lucky to be in the instance where I had a very good partnership with a bookstore. And then I had a very tepid like relationship with a bookstore. Like they're not like trying to hinder the work that I'm doing, but they're also not like trying to help forward that conversation. Um, but I think it's really important to realize you don't have to do everything today. You don't need to look at all of these grant programs because one of the things you might decide to do is environmental scan and look at all of these established grant programs and then be like, oh my gosh, how am I ever gonna do any of that? Well, they didn't start there. And that's really important to remember that they grew that over time. Um, so thinking through your capacity thinking through the questions that you need to answer in order to be ready to say yes or no to a publishing program at your institution is gonna be really helpful. I think this is my last slide and we can move into questions. And I'm right on time, which is a miracle, I swear. Yes, this is the last slide. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Uh, pull your chat so I can see it. Christina, were there any questions that popped through that need that you are already aware of that I need to answer? Thank you. <laughs> um, you're really, really great things. Uh, there was a request early on to share that spreadsheet that you use with the group. Um, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I will hunt it down and I will add it into um, the class notes for this session. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Um, there was some good comments. Um, Daniela made a comment that it would be really helpful to have a peer review group, um, especially when you were talking about the uh, communities of practice. Um, I think there's some really great resources about creating communities of practice. I don't know if you wanna talk about that anymore. Yeah, give me just half a second. So um, the first thing I'm gonna plug is the Rebus community for a peer review. 
um, what you can do there is you can set up your project there and you can do a call for peer reviewers. I have peer reviewed for several textbooks that way personally. And I've also pointed other instructors to that as an opportunity. And I will grab that link and put that in the chat. Um, but I do think that that's also a really great use of um, a community of practice, particularly if you're working with folks in the same discipline or college. Um, here we go, here's Reba's community. Thank you for sharing, Cheryl, Karen Pakula's stuff on learn, faculty learning systems, circles, and your own press book of learning communities. So um, Carla had a question. What are your recommendations for library staff helping administration understand the scaling of these programs? Well, that's a good question. Um, so I am in, uh, a position where I'm a staff member um, and I have pulled, been pulled into um, executive level discussions around affordability um, several times in my position so far. I've been at Ohio State for two years and um, one of them was very specifically about what do we need to scale up these initiatives and um, my recommendation is to put it in as plain of language as possible if you're providing a document. Um, and definitely like executive level summary and bullet points of very distinct and concrete explicit items that you need. Um, and try to get that to them before you meet in person to talk about it if you're gonna meet in person. And um, then in person, reiterate everything that was in the document that you sent them and ask them for specific questions that they might have. Um, because I find when they are thinking, they're thinking at a much different level than what I as the person on the ground doing the work and thinking about. So they're thinking about like, so for example, my Dean is thinking about how can he relay the information I have given him to the provost to have a conversation with the provost about affordability. And those bullet points need to be, need to look a little different. And so a lot of times he will take the information that I have given him and he will retranslate it into administration speak. Um, but I think it's important to be transparent in that communication and also to try and be concise. Um, and if you aren't already thinking about it in your program through the sort of like a phased approach, like I mentioned, um, starting to have conversations either with yourself, like through brainstorming or um, with your team, maybe as a brainstorming activity though, um, about what your program needs to scale up and to be sustainable um, should probably be baked in from the beginning, which is why I recommend taking a phased approach. Um, but they respond really well to the metric of if we transform this many courses, it will save X many dollars for students. Like they love money language and number language. And um, in fact, we had had a conversation about moving away from um, that kind of language of we say like student cost savings because like those numbers are never real. You're always like, deciding some weird metric where you're going to do that. So we're like, we've decided that all textbooks cost $100. And so we're going to multiply that by the number of students. And then we're going to get our cost saving number. And so long as you do that consistently across your program, that's fine. But those aren't real numbers about like what students are actually spending. But we were going to get away from that language and start talking about like the number of courses transformed. And we got really heavy pushback against that because donors and upper level institution administration, so provost, uh, president, still all respond really well only to like those dollar saving numbers. So that's something to keep in mind is like figuring out the language that they're using to tell the stories that you want to tell. 
I hope that was a, like really rambling, but okay answer to that question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Melissa had a follow up question um, regarding standards for interactive OER like H5P learning options. Um, is there a resource out there that you know of that lists standards for evaluating these interactives? I'd like to think it would cover things like accessibility, graphic design, best practices, et cetera. So I'm not aware of like a one single evaluation tool for that would look that would allow you to look holistically at a re, an interactive resource like that. Um, but there are separate evaluations that you can do. Um, I have a list of spreadsheets that I link people to when they do OER evaluation. And then I have a separate list for like accessibility, but I haven't seen anything that is geared specifically towards an H like an H5P learning object. But my, my recommendation would be, first of all, to see if, if, if that H5P in this specific example is one of the types that is accessible. Um, H5P has a list um, of what they consider to be accessible. Um, and then do your own like accessibility evaluation of the resources. Um, and remember that like, it's not a checklist, like nothing is ever gonna be perfectly accessible. You're working towards the best version of accessibility that you can get. Um, because I find that, that as you have conversations with your instructors in sort of your publishing program, they're going to demand that you give them an accessibility checklist and you say no to that. <laughs> And we reframe that as we're working towards as best as we can get with accessibility. Like you can't just check these boxes off and be like, hey, I'm good to go because things can continue to change and we can always do better. Um, but that would be my goal. I would start with um, accessibility for learning objects. That's where I would start is, are these accessible? Are they the best access accessible version that we can get? Um, and then do a cost benefit analysis of whether if, if they aren't like perfectly accessible, does that still, um, does that take enough away that they aren't valuable as the learning object that you intend them to be? Great, great answer. Thank you, Amanda. Um, if you have more questions, Feel free to uh, either raise your hand or put them in the chat. We have a little bit more time. One of the um, practices that to kind of build off of your answer, Amanda, one of the practices that I do is um, give faculty a list of and links to, um, you know, tutorials on like a hypothesis or H5P. And I don't actually ever ask them to create those types of resources because I personally don't have the capacity to support them in your learning process. And I find that the faculty that are interested and willing to go out there and learn and engage with the community and find the help they need are the ones that are going to utilize it. The others that kind of put it perfunctorily, that's a terrible pronunciation, sorry, um, into their textbook, it's not really utilized and not as beneficial to students, so. Yeah, I would say that there's a huge instructional design component that I, as a person, walk through people when they do interactive learning objects as part of their OER that, like, I would never expect anyone else to do because it's, like, in my weird specific skill set. Um, but th that's a great I, that's a great example of a teach the teacher moment where you gave them here are the, the here's the guide to the tool um, here's a great you know tutorial on how to do it that's the best I can do for you like that is a perfectly fine standard to have when you are looking through the capacity for what you have to support in your program. Lauren shared a great um, resource to H5P accessibility. Um, and that covers, I think, your question, Melissa, as well as um, Hunwen's comment about embedding in the LMS. This documentation shows accessibility options for LMS and any other platform. So 
Um, Elizabeth asks, what are the top three H5P resources asked for or created? Oh, okay. So I think that sort of varies by discipline. Um, I have seen a um, growing amount of people who are just fascinated by the branching scenario. I'm guilty of that as well. I used it in the course that I developed um, to walk people through OER searching. Um, and, but I would say oftentimes it is the, uh, um, the video tool where you can uh, basically gatekeep how students go through the presentation. Um, so you can put in quizzes and stuff throughout the video to make sure that they're actually watching and engaging with the material. Um, and then um, do, 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 I have to go look at my examples of H5P. So interactive video is what that's called. Um, I have also seen a lot of use of um, the basically any of the like fill in the blank um, so there's like a fill in the blank word, word, like you can ask questions and they have to like drop the word into that. Um, there's also a version, um, uh, for like multiple choice. Um, I've seen those used a lot and, um, And then it's just about like, are they using like it as a multiple choice question? Like, are they building good distractors the way that they should be is a question I often ask them. Um, and then I saw Melissa's follow up about H5P. Um, so I would make that if I was if I was doing a publishing program where I was responsible for uh, instructors who were thinking about using interactive learning objects like H5P, um, that would be part of their checklist um, before they could like make the book live, or if their book was already alive, it would be before they could um, before they could incorporate that learning objective. They would need to complete a checklist for it, and that would include um, them going into like a student view and testing the branching scenario. Um, and um, maybe even getting some peers to look at, look over it to make sure the instructions are solid, that sort of thing. But I think you can build parameters into the list of things that they're going to do on their end as the instructors who are building the thing and set that as an expectation. So um, at uh, Penn State for our publishing program, before we would make their books public to, um, the world, they would need to have gone through the Pressbooks checklist. So that would include things like making sure that they had accessible chapters so they were structured properly, um, that their images were licensed correctly and captioned correctly and had alt text. Uh, so we had like a checklist of what they would do and then they would turn that checklist into us. And um, we had, we were lucky to have two production specialists and we would have them make sure that that was true, that they did do all of those things. And um, so I think that you can build in sort of like a check and balance there for that. Wonderful. Well, we are coming to the end of our time. So thank you again, Amanda, for sharing. Uh, we appreciate all your experience um, and the information you gave us today. And thank you to everyone who came. Thank you for joining us as we continue to learn about open textbook publishing. Um, we hope that as we continue to share resources, one of your key takeaways is the knowledge and affirmation that you're not doing this work alone, um, that you do have this entire community to support you. If you have more questions about today's sessions or would like to chat, with others about this, please use the class notes. You can put links that you shared today. Um, we will put links to the slide in the class notes and use that as a way to talk through um, this topic. So please use those. And that ends our session today. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you all for having me as always. <laughs>